All right, thank you so much, Shelley, for the introduction. Hello and welcome to this seminar, web seminar on performance, scalability, and workload isolation for Oracle's Converge database. My name is Markus Michalewicz. I'm Vice President of Product Management, and I run Oracle Database Product Management for Scalability, High Availability, and MAA. And I'm here today with Sebastian Solbach, Senior Principal Product Manager in this team, specialized in MAA and scalability. And together, we would like to discuss with you how you can get the best performance, scalability, and workload isolation. And this is a little clarification from the title perhaps you have seen online for Oracle's Converge database. You will see what that difference in workload and isolation will, uh, will result in later. But for now, I thought it may have been good to first discuss what actually is Oracle's Converge database. And simply speaking, Oracle's Converge database is an Oracle database. It's not a special version. It's not a special edition. It's the Oracle database. More precisely, perhaps the Oracle database 19C, because a lot of the features and the functionality that we will be talking about today have been introduced particularly with Oracle database 19C. So you'll get the most out of it with Oracle database 19C. That said, the principles and the fun fundamental ideas are largely applicable to prior versions with some exceptions of features that only came in with 19 c Now, thinking of Oracle's database as a converged database engine means you can use different data types and models all in one database. You can have in-database machine learning applied to any model and data type that is stored in the Oracle database, whether it be re re relational data, native JSON data, or spatial data for that matter. We even allow for storing of text data and XML, which to a lot of you is probably not new, but we also have blockchain tables to, per, to provide temporary resistant roles. We allow for in-memory analytics as well as for graph data, all in the same Oracle database, and we will make, that, we make this data available to you via REST data services, so you don't necessarily have to have access, but access directly to the database. You can use a REST-based access. However, if you do have access to the database or you want to directly gather data from the Oracle database, we have native SQL access to all of the models and types stored in the Oracle database. That includes even external data that can be accessed via C C CSVs or HDFS or Hive or S3, for example. With that said, Oracle database is really an Oracle Converged Database engine providing a multi-model and a multi-workload database. And the benefits of these multi-model and multi-workload database is manifold. But let's look into what is the actual reason why Oracle has this converged database, which provides open SQL data, SQL and access to data to focus on innovation and not integration. And the secret to this innovation-based access is multi-model. You get the best of breed of the relational JSON spatial graph and so forth data in one Oracle database. You can base multiple types of workloads on these different data types and models, which means you can have high performance transactions, data warehouse, analytics, machine learning, even internet of things, all, all combined in one database, which means that your, pro, that your developer, developers and analysts are most productive because they can use the same SQL and transactions, operate on any data and workload, and they can do this either via integrated microservices or event-based, REST-based, as I formerly said, even with CI, CI, CD approaches. So it's really a model that allows you to be more productive, that allows developers and analysts to be more productive and not to see how you can integrate these different models into, each, into, a, into another. What is also very helpful is that, that despite of being such a converged model, we allow for modularization and containerization by different applications and workload. And the way we do this is using placable databases, basically the Oracle multi-tenant um, approach, which provides you with database containers per service. And what that means, and how it can help you with performance, scalability, as well as workload isolation, you will see this throughout this presentation. Now, the number one question that we get when we talk about the Oracle Converged Database, however, is, 
can a converged model such as Oracle is introducing is or has introduced it, can it ever be as performant looking at only one workload or looking at only one model? So in other words, can a converged database keep up with specialized databases such as special JSON-based databases or spatial oriented databases? And I think the answer is yes. And by the end of this presentation, you'll see why. And with that said, I would like to hand it over to my colleague, Sebastian, to speak about performance. Sebastian? Hi, everyone. So I hope you can hear me fine. Um, yeah, let's look a little bit into the performance aspect of a converged database. And as Marcus already has pointed out, um, the big question is, can a database which deals with all different kinds of data really be that performant as the database which is specialized? So first of all, uh, the Oracle database, as you know, is a database which is built for scaling. We do support multiple amounts of CPUs from small databases with a few up to thousands of CPUs and the database can, uh, can simply use these CPUs whenever they come online. So the, the database is online scalable as you will see this also in the cloud offerings which Oracle provides with auto scaling. And that it's a database with the known capabilities like uh, what Oracle introduced way, way back with the row level locking so that you can ensure that you do have different workloads, you are not competing for resources and especially writers do not block readers and the other way around and still ensuring your data is consistent. Uh, we did put a lot of effort into make, ensuring that the database scales online and uh, that goes in line with NUMA technologies on the chip level so that the database knows of that. Uh, we do scale workload with thousands of users, uh, essentially introducing capabilities way back with shared service or a little bit with 10G with the database resident connection pooling, allowing to surface multiple users at the same time, no matter which workload you actually want to run or what your application requires. Uh, we also have a mean in the database with the database resource manager to allow efficient usage of the CPUs in regards to the database itself, so that when you run multiple workloads, the workloads which is real, really dear to you is essentially getting the resources you require. And we will have a look at that one a little bit later as well when we do talk about the workload isolation, because that also becomes important in that regards in essentially distributing the amount of horsepowers you have to your different applications. So as Marcos already pointed out, um, the proof that we essentially can run specialized workload like JSON documents, for example, a lot faster is here, is here to show with a simple uh, measurement from the, there is a baseline for essentially document workload, which is Yahoo Cloud Servicing Benchmark. And here with 4 million documents, we just show that which Oracle on a simple autonomous JSON database. Now it's specialized for JSON, but just to be clear, an autonomous JSON database is not a specialized database just for JSON. It can simply be extended to also incorporate all other kinds of data. Uh, and you can upgrade it to a so-called autonomous transaction database, which can encompass all kinds of data. But there is a special, more affordable offering to just keep JSON documents. And we compare that with simple ADO CPU with the workload compared to MongoDB or an AWS instance with the same capabilities where you have dedicated databases just for the document workload. And you do see that Oracle is really more capable of providing your workload. And uh, we, especially you can see the difference also when it comes to more, more reads and writes. So it's not really dependent if you are looking at the distribution of the workload itself with 50% reads and 50% writes as we see on the, on the, first, but, uh, on the first bullet. 
but it also excels when you really have a more read-only workload, like 95% of the reads on these databases. And we did the same comparison with a little bit more documents just to show how capable the database is. And yes, if you do have 81 million, there's a little bit more to, to calculate. So we will get a little bit less operations per seconds overall, but we are still far better than MongoDB, uh, as you can see here. So that really should just prove that the Oracle database with the new introduced JSON data type really can excel specialized databases and really not just take away the burden of integration at a later point in time, but also to provide the performance respectively. So we didn't stop there. So the Oracle database also makes sure that whatever comes in new technology and which is available, and there's a large drift to essentially use persistent memory for your smaller databases. And we have with 19C and especially 21 now, have a fixed integration with the persistent memory of the database to for smaller databases to put them directly onto the persistent memory to excel even what we have seen before so that there is no IO code pass whenever we try to read the data uh, into, into the memory and essentially processes. So that is really capable for smaller databases, small in scale yet, because the persistent memory is not that big yet. But uh, it does provide the advantage if you do have a converged database to not only uh, trust in technologies which already are existing out there. So when it comes to data, um, yeah, especially if you do have different data, then different data requires different access pattern. And one of the advantages the converged database essentially provides is that it is not set in stone that you only have special indexing for your data. So an index does provide you the means of essentially optimizing your access pattern to the database. But if you do provide different kinds of data, set, so indexing sets. So for example, yes, you do have just normal column data in there, but you store text data. And even though you would say that, yes, a special database would have a text index, but uh, essentially you are storing uh, normal data, you still can use a text index across it. So we do have a variety of indexes really specialized for whatever workload you need. So for example, you, we do have the standard B3 indexes, we do provide bitmap indexes. We have special indexes for spatial data, which can be used, uh, but not just on, on spatial data. We even provide capabilities that you can create your own indexes based on functions or based on, um, on application domains which essentially is a programmatic way for yourself to increase the index access and the capabilities. Then you do have different methods to essentially use indexes with materialized views, which can be a way of accessing all kinds of data you have and speeding up the access, which is automatically maintained. And then for the engineered systems, we do have uh, integrated indexes, which we call storage index or zone map, which essentially under the cover improves your capability of accessing your data. Now, having these things is nice, but implementing these can be quite tedious because as you might know, sometimes creating an index for an application, for a read application might be better, but you could have a drawback on writing because the indexes has to be maintained. And so the question comes up then, if it really makes sense to create such a specialized index for your application, or if it wouldn't be better for your application to not create it because the drawbacks which are there are bigger. So that is a functionality we especially provide on the bigger systems specialized for the database or within the autonomous database, where we actually do in regular intervals, look at the access pattern of the data and decide if an index can be good for your application or maybe better not to implement it. And it will be automatically implemented on autonomous, which will speed up your access to data. 
With that being said, our, um, Marcus already mentioned this, we also have a different way to store your data in the database. So uh, while normally the Oracle database works in row format, there is the capability already since 11.2 uh, uh, that we do have the capability to store data in memory, which provides in Kalima access to your data, improving especially for data warehouse type applications uh, and bigger reporting the access to your data. The important aspect is that this can be enabled on basis of the pluggable database. So dependent on your data access to your converged data, you can just enable it for one or multiple PDBs and does not need to use it. New capabilities coming in that way is essentially the automatic populate, popularization of the population story of the um, in, in, in memory column store, uh, which now ensures that the data set, which essentially is populated, stays with the actual working data and not essentially keeping data in there, which is not needed for access. And this can be enabled in really all in memory databases by the automatic level with heart. Last but not least, if you have data, it will, it will grow over time and databases get bigger and bigger. However, more data, as you have seen with the, uh, with the um, Yahoo benchmark, which I showed before, the more data you have, the more time it is required to process your data. Partitioning can be a very good way to not only improve performance, but also to save costs on tiering your data to different storage tiers and so to provide capabilities. Oracle helps you in identifying and finding the right partition approach. We do have partition advisors here and uh, the autonomous database again itself does automatically, can automatically partition your data for performance. With that being said, let's have another look on scalability and go back to Marcus. Right, thank you so much, Sebastian. When I want to talk about scalability, and I will do this in a minute in greater detail, I want to go back one step and address a question that we have been asked as well. And the question is, well, if you use Oracle Converge database, then one of the challenges people see is how to easily deploy and perhaps create starter databases right from the start. So in other words, before you actually can scale, using converged database seems to have left an impression that it's harder to deploy the very first database right before you can actually even start scaling. So I wanna talk briefly about the many ways to deploy an Oracle database, given the software deployment, but also how to, how to create starter databases rather swiftly so that you can get to work faster. And the first way of doing, and the most traditional way is probably of, of deploying Oracle software and then potentially creating a starter database is using the Oracle Universal Installer or OUI, which can be combined in latest versions also with an RPM-based product. It's really the standard to deploy Oracle database software, that is the binaries, but it also gives you an option to create a starter database as part of the dialogue if you supply. There is an RPM database install, so if you'd like to deploy via RPM-based means on Linux, for example, then this would be another alternative. However, doing so is a manual work and you would have to access the host on which you want to operate on a per host basis. Another approach which has shown to be very convenient specifically and as we go into environments in which you want to deploy more than one database um, more frequently are VMs and containers. For example, for VMs, we have provided the Oracle VM templates for the Oracle single instance, as well as for Oracle Rack databases for the longest time. And we have used those templates on our own deployments. We still use them in our Oracle Cloud in, in, in some areas. But they are a means of deploying your database in Oracle VM. We do not necessarily support the same way for other VMs, but for Oracle VM, we have a solution there. As of late, we also support Docker containers. Well, when I say as of late, Oracle Docker containers have been provided for the single instance database 
I think for four years or so, 2018, and we're fully supported. What we have recently added to the support for Docker containers is rack-based Docker containers or Docker containers for Oracle Real Application Cluster databases, which are currently supported in full production or full, for full production with Oracle Database 21C and 19C coming up. So either way, you can benefit from it. Deploying the database in containers or VMs, for that matter, makes it faster specifically for the initial install and depending on the amount of customization you would like to perform for the deployment as and or the starter database. We are very flexible in providing images via VMs or containers, specifically with containers, in that we don't necessarily provide you with a final image. You can customize so that your database container is patched during the process or is created using the right patch set that you'd like to use. We also will support Potman. Potman has already seen some support for the single instance database for Rack databases. It's coming up. Now, going back to the more traditional way, if you want to use a Oracle Universal installer or RPM-based approach, so you want to have more control how and when and in which way you not only deploy, but also maintain your Oracle estate, but you have a larger fleet, and fleet patching and provisioning may be the solution for you. FPP, as it's called in short, uses existing tools to deploy and maintain database software deployments. That means you not only can provide or use it for the provisioning of the very first database uh, deployment, you can also use it to maintain the deployments you have already made. And it works across versions, platforms, and deployments. So it can be used, um, for example, within containers, or VMs. Last but not least, and from left to right, you can probably see how the speed to provide the first database, how, to, how fast we can deploy the first database has increased because in the Oracle Cloud, you can deploy a new Oracle database in minutes using database cloud services. So it's not only faster, it's also more convenient because the deployments include the database creation. On the other hand, there may be some configurations that we do not support as part of database cloud services, but you can always find a way to customize to some degree. So that said, there is many ways to deploy an Oracle database. And that is the basis for really providing a database solution to your customers faster. Now, once you've done this, you can look into how we can actually provide scaling for the database. Now, as most of you will know, scaling comes in two directions, vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling and the aspects of performance have already been covered by Sebastian in the previous section, basically describing how Oracle Database in itself can provide a very sound foundation for a good performance of your workloads. In the subsequent part of this presentation, we will therefore more focus on the scale out and also sharding. And the important thing to notice here is that Oracle thereby is supporting scale out and sharding as well as scale up provides the fundamental scalable deployment architectures. There are not many ways of scaling an Oracle database, and there are not many ways of scaling a database in general, and Oracle database supports all of which. Now for the scale out, um, as you can see here, we support Oracle Real Application Clusters, of course, in short rack, and I will be talking about this just in a minute. And if you'd like to scale out read, so you would wanna have read replicas, for example, Active Data Guard is a very good solution. Now, most of you will have looked at Active Data Guard perhaps for the purpose of disaster recovery, but really um, we have looked into Active Data Guard and enhanced this solution to be a read replica, not only for and in combination with the Converge database, but also for the sharding case about which we will talk in a few minutes. And last but not least, Oracle Golden Cake can be used to scale out active, active perhaps, but Data Guard and Golden Gate will not be focus of this presentation. I will be talking about Oracle Racken later on. Sebastian will be talking about Oracle Sharding, which is yet another of the fundamental scalable deployment architectures which Oracle Converge Database can utilize. If you'd like to know more about either of these architectures, um, our colleague Christian Kraft has written a nice article in the blog linked below here. So if you'd like to follow up after the presentation, that might be an interesting read for you. Coming back to the traditional way of horizontally scaling the Oracle database, which for most is Oracle Real Application Clusters. There may have been other ways, but 
if you had asked an old Oracle person, so to speak, what is the way to scale Oracle database, then the answer Oracle Rack probably would have come back very soon, and it still remains to be the answer for the Oracle Converge database. Oracle Rack has been on the market for 20 years. That doesn't mean we haven't improved. Oracle Rack is constantly improving scalability and high availability to protect your data automatically as well as faster. And I have shown here you only some of the features, performance as well as high availability improving features over the last version, starting with 11.2, going all the way up to 21C. And clearly, I can impossibly talk about all of them today. And many of them you will probably find majorly on this slide, some of which we haven't really documented because some of these features in itself are rather small and there isn't much to manage around them. They were introduced and intended to improve the scalability and or the high availability of Oracle Rack, sometimes with very, with very special use cases in mind. However, the sum of all of these features, the sum of all of these improvements have led to a much better performance with Oracle Database 19C than you may have seen in Oracle Database 11.2. So if your experience with Oracle Rack is based on 11.2 performance tests, I strongly suggest and encourage you to perhaps run the same tests with 19C in which we have focused, for example, on highly congested workloads and the improvement of those. So if you had a workload that was highly congesting uh, in 11.2, you may have the chance to see an improvement just by upgrading to Oracle 19C. And so I would perhaps encourage that test. That said, the fundamentals of Oracle Rack have really not changed a whole lot because they are proven technically as well as empirically. In Oracle Rack, at most three instances are involved in getting access to any piece of requested data. So in my four node cluster here, for accessing one piece of data, I will never have to access more or touch, as we also call it, more than three instances. And that is because of the scenarios in which that access could be requested. Let me give you some examples. If you are connected to any of these four instances and the data you want to access is residing in the instance on that node and also managed, meaning administered on the instance or in the instance on that node, then you have a full local access to that data. It's called a locally cached data access and it's served immediately. There's no delay, even in case it, that particular object that you're touching by reading or requesting data, even if that object isn't managed in that database, there is only a message to be sent to make it accessible to you, but you don't have to send any data. It's served directly to you. Now, it could be that you are connected to an instance and the data you'd like to read, not write, but read, is residing in one of the remote instances. Well, in this case, what will happen is the remote read data request will be served directly. In other words, you only, and that will be done by REC, REC will go over to the other instance and request the data to be shipped to you for the purpose of the read in another instance. That's just a simple data shipping. Where it does become a little bit more complicated is if you have a remote write request. Now, remember what Sebastian said, writes never block reads in Oracle and reads never block writes. But in the end, if you have a write request, there is some more coordination to be done in the background for it to be served as quickly as possible. For that reason, I've given you here the uttermost scenario in which all of the three components are dispersed across, across the most number of instances, which then shows why you will never have to touch more than three. Let me uh, draw you the picture. First, you have the requester. That is the instance in, into which you are connected or to which you are connected and into which you would like to get the data to operate on it. If you now have a write request to data that is sitting on another instance, the first thing you need to request, and it kind of goes in parallel really, is write access. So if there is a write access, you need to have the lock management being taken care of. So the requester instance will send a message to the coordinator and the coordinator will then send a message to the holder, either saying, yes, he can have that piece of data, and yes, he can have um, write permissions to it. Um, 
That is, if the piece of data you want to modify can be modified on the block that you're indirectly requesting. And the last thing that needs to happen then is the holder of the data, which we assume in my example here is yet another instance, would have to send the data to the requester. And as you can see here now, to access one piece of data in a REC cluster, only three instances need to be touched. The one on which you're requesting the data, the coordinator instance, which is basically the one that manages the locks for the data that you want to write to, and then the holder of the data. And in all three cases, what will happen is you have two messages been sent between the requester and the coordinator and the coordinator and the holder. And then you have one data being one piece of data being shipped, normally a data block or multiple of those, so multiple data blocks from the holder to the requester. But no matter how many nodes you have in your cluster, there will be no, no, there will be no need to touch more instances. And that is the reason why REC delivers customer proven and near linear scalability, regardless of the number of nodes used. And we have multiple customers that I could have listed here on the slide. I've just chosen three, Nodea, PayPal, and Kindred, which have all at least four node deployments, at least for the most part. Kindred has even RAC databases up to 20 nodes. And they have used RAC because it enables them to scale out very smoothly without having to change the application because RAC is really delivering the data um, to the instance where it is needed. And that's why we nearly linearly scale all workloads and we have done so for decades. Now, that said, another way of scaling is charting. And with that, I'll give back to Sebastian. Okay, with uh, the real application cluster in design has the requirement to have the data locally. Now, with sharding, the, this is a different approach. So some applications need to have to share the data globally. And with the design of real application cluster, sharing data globally is not easily possible because you have the interconnect traffic, which is designed on a low latency protocol. So to essentially scale your applications globally and across dis larger distances, you essentially need to segregate your data by means of localization. So if you only access data in, in, Frank uh, in Germany, then you would have the data sitting in Germany just containing the German data and the data for the US would be sitting in US. So you would start sh uh, sh sharding your data in specific shards which is logically dividing your database in separate smaller databases, so to speak. Um, so Oracle sharding itself, with the help of that logical access pattern, avoids that you have to access all data, and but you also have your application to be designed a little bit differently as you have to ensure to access the shard, which essentially contains your data. Um, so not that you're coming from Germany and you're accessing the data in the US and you actually want to have the German data. That wouldn't make sense. So, so that is an, a knowledge which needs to be built into the applications or as essentially into a sharding director, which essentially ensures that you will essentially connect to the correct site. Um, so you essentially still can use native SQL to shard your database across. Uh, so the Oracle database helps you to set up these shards and it will ensure that uh, you also can set high availability for your shards either by protecting it with data guard or essentially with golden gate. Uh, and we you essentially got connecting to a local director database, which is knowing where the data is sitting and allowing you to access the correct chart for your database. So with that being said, Oracle sharding does provide linear scalability across the shards and you can easily shard out. Uh, so if you need, if a database becomes too big and you want to segregate the data for, further, there are easy capabilities to do that. Uh, on the other side, with the help of Data Guard and Gold Gate, you do have extreme availability as the data is not only sitting in a single site, but also replicated to a disaster shard, so to speak, which will keep the data as well. If you lose one sh shard, first of all, your data isn't lost. 
Secondly, um, the data, even if the whole shard is gone and you do not have a data guard or something set up, it does not affect your other database queries. So if the German site should be down for whatever reason, uh, you will not be affected when you query the US data by this. Um, and so Oracle sharding does provide you with the capability of not only spread your data across separate instances, but it also provides you with a geographic distribution of your data and ensuring high availability and uh, scalability for your data. That it scales uh, does essentially have a few customer already implemented because sharding is not a new technology, it was 21 or 19, it does exist a little longer. And it was essentially really done for customers who had this big scale requirement. And one of these customers is BlueKai. BlueKai is a data management platform for essentially commercial data to track this. And they essentially track millions of transactions per second in a database with an overall database size of 2.5 petabyte, which is quite large. Now, not each shard has that size, definitely, but it's an overall size. And so BlueKai is really able to manage your data for the and essentially getting out where the user is connecting to, where the user is accessing your data. And they do provide this all with low latency and uh, really low access time for the physical shot. If something happens, as I said before, in case of, uh, of Blue Kai, they have used data guard to essentially protect these shards. And so the failover really happens seamlessly if something should happen to one of the shards they are using. Oops. I think someone just pressed a button. <laughs> so one second. So the important part here is that charting is not alone. I already talked about that charting can be protected by using data guard. So you essentially get scaling with real application cluster. You can essentially combine the real application cluster with data guard, but you also have the capability to essentially, uh, oh, I think someone, to essentially use that with charting which we have seen before. So coming back to how does this whole scaling look like in the Oracle Cloud? Um, so if I would like to use the capability. So first of all, you do get real application cluster in, in the Oracle Cloud, either with a two node VM database cloud service, or you could decide to have a larger real application cluster with up to 32 nodes on the Exadata cloud service, which is online, extensible. So you can start with two nodes. And if you are essentially seeing that you do need more power for your database and two nodes are not sufficient, you can essentially add the nodes online. This is not an immediate thing like uh, scaling up the OCPUs, which you can also do. So it takes uh, a, a few hours until the new node is automatically added. Um, but essentially you can scale your database, as I said, up to 32 nodes in OCI as of today. Um, if you do really want to have seamless scalability and automatic scaling, so not just adding nodes, then the autonomous database does provide the capability for you either on dedicated or shared hardware. So which essentially is an exadata under the cover, but it does provide you with the capabilities to easy online scale your database and also to have auto scaling enabled so that when the resource manager or your database recognizes it needs more compute capacity to handle your workload, it can automatically scale up. The combination which we have seen before of real application cluster and data guard in the Oracle Cloud is mostly by simply clicking on a button. So on an XCS instance, you can essentially have active or normal data guard accommodated 
And this will create the whole data guard environment for you with easy automation. But you still have to tell us that you want to have data guard set up. And uh, if for autonomous, you get the same thing with the integrated autonomous data guard, which even does provide you with automatic failover in case something happens. For XSCS, you would need to configure the observer manually which is possible, so you can essentially do that. But uh, there, the, uh, the task is essentially on you, whereas on autonomous, this is fully integrated and you essentially just give the destination regions where you want your data guard, autonomous data guard to be set up and then essentially to fail over in case of a disaster or if something nasty happens. Last but not least, Oracle sharding is also available in Oracle Cloud. As of today, it's more code-based form. So there's a nice Oracle Terraform script, uh, which allows you to set up the sharding on top of database cloud services. So with the database cloud service instance, you essentially, well, with multiple, we have to say with the multiple database cloud service instances, these Terraform scripts allow you to easily set up multiple shards with the traffic director in front to and all the network um, setup, everything in that Terraform script to help you with the setup. And this is getting extended over the time to also support other database cloud offerings. With that, back to Marcus for the workload isolation. Thank you, Sebastian. To me, we are now coming to probably the most interesting part of the presentation in which we talk about workload isolation. And as I mentioned early on, when it comes to workload isolation in Oracle's converged database, then Oracle multi-tenant or the Oracle multi-tenant architecture based on PDBs, plugable databases, are really the architecture that helps us achieving a good amount of workload isolation. And it's important because if you think about it, converged database, converges the workload of different applications into one. So having a good means of providing self-contained isolated databases, so to speak databases as a service as the first slide would have shown, is essential. And that is exactly what pluggable databases do. Now, pluggable databases have actually multiple advantages when it comes to converged database. We will be focusing on their isolation aspect today, more so than we would perhaps on the scale out or operational um, benefits. However, I do want to say that PDBs enable transparent, simplified online lifecycle operations for any application. So in other words, as you start with perhaps only one PDB in your converged database and you add more, and perhaps you see the need to move one PDB to another container database just because it doesn't fit the current one anymore or you want to logically reorganize your databases across your estate, PDBs provide a lot of benefits in this regard. You have rapid deployment with hot cloning, you have fresh refresh and, and incremental refresh if you need to have that clone being refreshed accordingly. You have relocation with no downtime, which is very essential if you need to move a PDB, and you have PDB upgrades. So PDBs PDBs speed up the database migration between new containers, but also into the cloud, just as a side note for the rest of this presentation. As it comes to consolidation, however, it's probably very important to many of us that the workload that we combine in one converged database doesn't interfere with each other. So if you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight different workloads, you do not want to have the eight ones interfere with all of the first seven or some other scenarios of similar kind. There, that is where Oracle Multi-Tenant Resource Manager and respective enhancements in the later version of Oracle Database, especially 19C again, comes in. As you may know, in early versions of Oracle Database, let's say 12C for that matter, the memory management of PDBs as well as the CPU management as well as other aspects of the PDB management was basically on CDB basis, you would have designed your CDB so that you have multiple PDBs in mind, and then would have given each PDB within the CDB, within the container database, a certain amount of share of resources. 
So basically, if you had four and they were all equally distributed, you would have said 25% of the resources available to the CDB would go to the PDB. While this works for a lot of cases, there are certain cases in which some PDBs are more important. And also the share aspect of things didn't necessarily address all the scenarios in which um, workload could interfere. So what we have done over time, and especially um, starting in Oracle Database 19C or with Oracle Database 19C, I don't want to say we started there, is we have improved the memory management, for example, so that the resource management parameters can now be set on a PDB level. In other words, you can have a DB cache size or a share pool size defined on the PDB level and then defines the minimum buffer cache. But it's really not the minimum that most of us would care about when it comes to workload isolation. It's the protection. For that reason, you can also define the PGA, personal memory, aggregate limit, and PGA aggregate target. Now, as you know, probably painfully so, the PGA aggregate target for the longest time didn't ensure that PGAs wouldn't grow beyond its designed target. Now we have PGA aggregate limit, which allows you to set a maximum PGA size. And the same parameter can be used on the CDB as well as on each PDB within the CDB nowadays. And so the memory aspect would be isolated um, from the different use cases. When it comes to IO, similar applies. Now, I want to preempt, there is an IO resource manager that is only available to you on Exa data, and it's very sophisticated and it works on a per cell level. But if you don't use Exa data and you still want to benefit from a converged database and PDBs, there are two new pure PDB IO parameters that I'd like to mention today, max IOPS and max MBPS. And as you can imagine, the one um, allows you to set the maximum number of IO operations, whereas the other one allows you to set the maximum megabytes of IO per second for the PDB. And these settings can be done on any generic storage. They can't actually be done on Exadata. And they regulate um, how much of IO resources each of your PDBs can get. And if you'd like to know what would be a good number, there's actually a view, dba underscore hist rsrc underscore PDB underscore metric. Very easy name, as you can see. But <laughs> once you have found this view, you can see what is the IO usage of your PDB and then set these parameters according the documentation will provide you with more details. Just as a side note, the automatic throttling of IO based on share, so basically the kind of shares that I described and will describe in a minute for CPU is still supported, but these two new parameters, max IOPS and max BB, uh, MBPS will provide you a higher granularity and control over your IO, IO settings. Speaking of control, there is also a new or improved way, as it was an enhancement, to limit CPU consumed by a specific PDB. Starting with Oracle Database 12.2, you can set the CPU count as a per PDB parameter. For some of you, that may not be new, but it's an, e, uh, it's an important um, complementary setting, given that we have improved the memory and the I.O parameters as already discussed. So what that means is for the CPU, you don't need to recompute the percentage when migrating PDBs between boxes of different configurations, for example, uh, because the percentage setting uh, is, is basically on a per PDB basis or the CPU setting is basically on a per PDB basis. The percentage setting, I meant to say, is still supported for backward compatibility. And so you have a bit of flexibility here between the two settings. In the end, Oracle Multi-Tenant Resource Manager will help you significantly prevent workloads to interfere with each other. And that is important because as you move your PDBs into other container databases, some of your um, scenarios may change and you may actually do this because you want to benefit from scaling. And that's why we also have integrated Oracle Multi-Tenant and Oracle Rack early on in the development process. So we have a tight integration between Oracle Multi-Tenant and Oracle Rack ever since 12.2, and it really comes as a benefit to you now that you use a converged database. Assume you have the setting here on the left where you have a shop, and then you have a ship application, and then you have a stock application. If you now combine all of those, and I assume you already have done this in the converged database, you want to make sure that these workloads don't 
interfere with each other. But more importantly, you may also have a need to scale out workloads independently. And you can do this very easily with RAP. You can take your single instance CDB containing all these three PDBs, free of charge at this moment of time, and bring it over with online relocation, for example, into a rack based container database, and then deploy your JSON database, your ship database, and your stock database as you see need, as you see fit. Now, notice here, I have already scaled my ship database. I assume the business is going well, and I have opened up the PDBs in two rack instances, thereby scaled horizontally just by migrating the PDB into a rack container database, and I can then put my stock database next to it later at the same time, but I can do all these operations online and independently. Now, you get more than just the relocation part here. What you get in Oracle Rack is PDB isolation, because what we have done is we have, for example, prevented noisy neighbors from affecting others with unnecessary chatter. Now, in my example that I created previously, what that means is that the ship database instances, the two pluggable databases open in two instances of RAC database, they may chat with each other and they may exchange messages as it would be needed for scaling out in RAC and as Sebastian and I described before. However, JSON, the JSON or the shop, as you remember, the shop and the stock application, they are completely isolated from that chatter. There is no need for RAC to talk to these instances on behalf of the shipping application because they do not share data. And that kind of knowledge is integrated into RAC for the purpose of isolation. We also, and as we can isolate and identify different workloads in a RAC database, as long as they are encapsulated in a PDB, we prevent instance failures hosting singleton only PDBs from affecting other instances. Notice here the singleton only PDBs, which basically means in my example, the JSON or the shop or the um, stock application, which are residing on the very outside instances on the left and on the right. In the middle here, I have my ship application. But if, for example, the very right stock application, application should fail, my ship and or the shop JSON application are completely isolated from the failure. There is no data that has been shared between the application running on the very right. So no other instance in the rack cluster will be affected by that failure. So it's an easy way for you to consolidate not only rack and scaling requiring um, workload, but also to consolidate formally independent, isolated or independent singleton workload, just in case you may have to scale out later, which is very easy in a rack cluster. You just add another PDB in another instance, open it up there, and you will be good. With that said, Sebastian. So when it comes to essentially sharing data, I mean, it, it is very easy, so to speak, to ensure on the PDB level that you do not interfere. However, there are things when it comes down to operating system access, for example, where it does become a little bit more difficult to essentially segregate the access. So that essentially belongs to anything which is going outside of the database, like for example, using UTL SMTP or UTL file, which is writing. So uh, when it comes to operating system access, file system access, writing files to the operating system. So that really, if you have to do this for multiple databases, endangers your database that you might be possibly overwriting things from, from other databases or even having a security access. The other thing is uh, operations which need administrative features. So with that being said, the um, Arco database has capabilities to protect you for that. So what in regards of operating system access? For operating system access, we do have uh, so-called PDB OS credentials. So you can ensure that everything which is happening from a PDB is essentially using a special set of OS credentials, which allows you to use OS ACLs to protect you from accessing things or essentially identifying who is executing. For file access capabilities and to ensure that 
each PDB writes into a different destination. There is a so-called pass prefix, which can be set when the PDB is created, ensuring that whenever you are specifying a file destination to write files to the operating system, the pass prefix is always pre-appended, so to speak, uh, so to ensure that one PDB is not accessing the same file system directories as the other PDB. Note, however, the pass prefix can only be set when the PDB is getting created. It can't be changed later. For that, you need to unplug uh, and plug in the database again. Then uh, that is the only way to change the pre pass prefix today. For the other three capabilities, so network administrative access or common user or common access, the solution which was introduced with pluggable database is the so-called PDB lockdown profiles. And honestly, you can see all these three things in action when you are looking at an autonomous database, because that is essentially what the autonomous database is using internally to essentially on the one side protect you from accessing anything else running an autonomous shared, or even uh, to, to make the difference profiles for the JSON specific database or for the uh, autonomous data warehouse database that is mainly using lockdown profiles. There's a simple guide how to use this in the blog post above, which you can look at. But let's look a little bit closer at the profiles itself. And the most interesting thing is normally what can be done with grants. A grant normally allows you to do either all or nothing. So if you do grant all the system to a special PDB user, the user actually gets quite a lot because he, he gets cursor sh sharing, he, he gets PLS QL code. So it includes a lot of things which are in the auto system. A PDB lockdown profile now allows you to essentially say, yes, auto system is allowed, but I do not allow it to set specific, uh, to, to set specific things except things like PLS. So, so you can essentially lock down the auto system for the PDB user to really just be a few specific things and not changing resource manager plans as normally the auto system would include. So that concludes our section about workload isolation and when what can be done to protect you for this. So let's summarize what we have seen from the start. So first of all, uh, the Oracle Converge database does provide you with all capabilities required to run different workloads with optimal performance. It does allow you to scale your workloads depending on requirements let it be geographical requirements where sharding is more prominent or using the shared database approach with real application cluster. But in combination, really important. So e each shard can also be a real application cluster if you require that to be. And last but not least, if you are consolidating multiple databases into one and uh, so have a real converged database, the Oracle database does provide you with all the capabilities to isolate your workload and to ensure that your database is still running with the performance you need and the security requirements you have. With that being said, thanks for listening. Um, here you do again have our contact details. If there are any more questions which can't be answered now, thanks for listening.